during this um, whole series of elections and things like that, uh, it's, it's pretty clear American culture has reverted back to what we saw in Exodus, where people are utilizing individuals to become idols, and we're using God as weaponry to get what we want. It's pretty clear throughout scripture that God sets kings and queens. Uh, here's, here's how I look at it. There, there was a, there was a uh, I don't believe God is in the ballot box voting for people, but I believe God uses who we vote for and in his sovereignty, he makes it work together for our good. Not, I wanna say not for our good, but for his agenda, okay? So let me say it this way, in a, from a biblical context, there, there was a, uh, a trial, Jesus was, Jesus was charged with sedition. Um, sedition was the, was the official charge that got him crucified. He was saying that he was the king of the Jews. He was saying that he was the one that you need to follow. And then they, they held a trial, a mock trial, and, and then they gave them a vote. And the vote was you could either choose Jesus, let him free, or Barabbas. During the Passover, they'd release one person that was a criminal, and, and the people voted to release Barabbas instead of Jesus. Now, that wasn't the right decision, but God knew that they were going to do that, allowed them to do that, and used it to advance the cross in Calvary. So God is in his omniscience, knows ahead what's going to happen before we even know. Here, here's Genesis. Genesis says that God gives man free will. You do whatever you want with your choice. Um, don't eat the fruit. But before, when man eats the fruit, God already knows. Hey, Rob, how you doing, buddy? Before he knows, before he knows, God, God saw him at the gym and picked on him about coming to church. It's so good to see him. Um, God, God saw that. And before they even made a decision, before the foundation of the world, he had a lamb that was already slain. So you start wondering, well, God, why would you have a lamb that's slain if you knew they were going to make their decision? Why, why didn't you just let the lamb be in the place and they didn't have any decision? God's not going to violate our free will. God's going to let us make choices. The, the objective is, is this, is that what, whomever is in leadership, we are responsible to pray for and hold them accountable for the things that we, we are not. America keeps quoting, we're a Christian nation. We are a nation of people who are believers, but we don't have the tapestry of Christianity running through our fibers. As we can see, there are various versions of Christianity that many people are reading that will allow you to go to church on Sunday and hate on Monday. Right? There's, a, there, there's something wrong if we're all praying to, one's praying to one God so their candidate can win, the other's praying to God so their candidate can win. And, and then you start wondering like, okay, which God are we praying to? And people are saying they're hearing from God and, and scripture is pretty clear. We need to hold people accountable for what they say in the name of the Lord, right? We don't, we don't have to do it like the world does, but we hold them accountable and holding people accountable is not hating, it's not mean, it's biblical. And what we oftentimes call hating is what we call scripture. No one wants to be accountable for what they say but there is an action and a responsibility for all believers. My heart and my hope is that during this time, you will hear this with, with, with your heart and your spirit. I've been saying this for a while. I think no matter who wins, I think America is in a time of its life. And the reality is, is if you have revenue and income, I always have been saying this for the last year and two, that you need to save your money because your money will eventually save you. And it doesn't matter who's in office, the reality is, is as long as people deviate from the purpose and the plan of God, God will turn his back on a country and allow them to serve their own interests. And so I caution you as believers, as people of faith, we are to pray, we are to work, not just pray. We are to hold conversations that are difficult we are not just to run away and hide behind prayer because most of us ain't praying anyway, okay? Uh, we need to hold, hold conversation. We need to pray. But we also need to realize that 
There's a lot of versions of Jesus that's out there that doesn't represent or align with scripture. And so we, we, we have to be, look, I've been invited on both sides. My thought is this, I don't wanna be bought by anybody. I don't wanna be able to say what I wanna say. So I tell you as people of faith that you need to just not just pray, but you need to hold tough conversations. You know, the, the election should not cause you to lose people because of who they voted for. But it should make you aware to what people believe. And that's important because how, how you view a thing is how you think about a thing. How you think about a thing is how you process things. So that's critically important. And so my, <laughs> this morning, I, you know, honestly, I didn't know what to preach. I'm not even gonna lie to y'all. I was like, okay, Lord, what are we going to do this morning? And usually I have my message by Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm framing it, Thursday, I'm framing it, Friday, I'm finishing it, Saturday, I'm finishing it, Sunday morning, I'm finishing it, and I ain't hear nothing. It was Saturday, and I was like, oh, God, we get mighty close to uh, what the Lord needs to say. Um, and, uh, man, it was... I was at dinner with my wife and I heard this word and I was like, that's it. That is. You're late, but you came, God. Thank you. Um, Second Peter chapter number one, verse number 10. I do, oh, yeah. Second Peter chapter number. Here's what the famous Augustus says. He's a African theologian, he's my favorite. You'll probably hear me quote him at least once a month. It says, without justice, what are the kingdoms but a great gang of bandits? You, you, <laughs> without justice, what are kingdoms but a great gang of bandits? Let me give you a little history and I'll get into my message. When Christianity was legalized by Constantine in 325 AD, Christianity was now known as the religion of the empire. It actually hurt the empire because they were able to politicize the religion. They were able to monetize the religion and Christianity stopped growing at the rapid pace that it once grew. Because when you try to politicize God, you lose him. So it's critically important that we understand that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. The Bible isn't a book that we pick and choose which particular sin we wanna stick with. We have to have a holistic view of scripture and analyze it as such. The church's job is to be salt in the midst of darkness, light in the midst of darkness, salt in the midst of a lack of saltiness. But uh, this morning, I want to help you. <laughs> I want to help you because I want to read verse 10 in the 2 Peter 1, verse 10. I'm going to read verse 10, and then I'm going to read chapter number 1. I want to actually read it out the ESV version um, because I feel like that connects to exactly what I'm trying to convey, and it is actually probably the closest translation to the original language. All right, 2 Peter chapter number 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 10. It says this, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So Paul, uh, Peter says this, Make sure that your election is sure. Let's go to verse number 1. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires for this very reason make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, 
and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For these qualities are yours and are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted, that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, beloved, make and do all diligence to make sure your election is sure. Peter is writing in this particular time with a group of people that are suffering. They are in the midst of persecution and suffering really, really bad. And Peter's job is writing a letter to encourage this particular church. And he's writing to them about election. And I thought how befitting it would be to talk about this election. In verse number, verse number, one of the things that he says in verse number three is, God has given us, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need. And you may want to underline the word given or highlight it, because it's not what we use in our English language as like someone just handing it over to you. It is what God divinely bestows upon you. God bestows it upon you. He endows you with it. It carries the idea that if God elected you and I, it shows the value of the gift. And because he knows the gift is valuable, he places on the gift the ability, the power to be able to accomplish these things. Verse number four is very important too because it uses this interesting word that is there. In verse four it says, because his glory and excellence, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great precious promises that are promises that enable you to share divine nature and escape the world's corruption. So he gives this word that's kind of a word, that's a dance word. It's called, it's, it's a Greek word, but it's, it's dealing with the, the idea of choreographing. That God in his infinite wisdom has choreographed within us these certain virtues that are there to help us. As we dance with these virtues, we become better and we, begin, we become able to find the rhythm of life when we dance with these virtues. And so one of the most polarizing times in our country is the election of the president. We are bombarded with ads, text messages, interceptions on our YouTube for a political ad vying to get our vote at the election. The election is where one chooses a candidate that best fits one's moral compass or personal preference. One has to sift through the history of all of the negative things of a candidate. One has to go through all the dirt of a candidate and form, in their opinion, which candidate, despite knowing all the dirt, would serve their interests the best. Interestingly, our position as people is we elect them before the set day in hopes on the set day they do what they said. Without an election, we don't have a person assigned for the office. Once elected, the person is president, but they must maintain their core values of the country. They could be impeached, but they will still be referred to as president. Well, beloved, elections is not just a USA thing. It's a biblical thing. Peter speaks about this personal election. A long, long before you and I were an embryo, there was an election happening in the courts of eternity. The Supreme Judge elected those called by his name. The manifestation of this election happens at different stages of our lives. But Peter tells us to make sure if we have accepted being elected, as God will not force his election upon us, he died for all, according to John 3:16, and like the great banquet Jesus gives, where he literally invites certain guests, but they, are, they have the choice to attend the banquet. Some declined, and then Jesus went out to the vineyard and invited others to come be a part of this banquet that was reserved for others who did not opt into the election. This morning, I want to talk about the election. <laughs> not the presidential one, but the personal one. My subject this morning in this series is the election. If I were petty, I would call it, your apple has been elected. But you'll have to hold that if you're an aspiring preacher to know what that means. So here's what I want to talk to you about, this idea of election. When God is looking at humanity, he is electing those that are going to be a part of his work in the earth. God does not save you and I just so you and I can shout in church. 
God doesn't save you and I just so you and I can say, I'm a Christian. God saves us to influence culture. God saves us to influence culture. There is a massive problem when you don't see Christians influencing culture. When culture is influencing Christians, we got it backwards. Christians should be influencing culture. You should be influencing the music place. You should be influencing technology. You should be influencing media. You should be influencing politics. I know that's new for some of you because you just believe that growing up, I'm going to get saved, get my name in a Lamb's Book of Life, and I'm going to be no earthly good until I get to heaven. The reality is Jesus did not die so that he can just save your seat in heaven. He died to save your seat in heaven, but also for you to occupy until he comes. Christians should be leading the discussions about marriage. Christians should be leading the discussions about sexuality. But we are oftentimes afraid to talk about what God has anointed us to talk about. And very clearly, Peter is talking to this group, and he's saying to them, God has elected you, but you need to make sure that your election is sure. Because while we're cascading everybody else and their belief system, ours may be eroding away. And so God, and Paul even says it this way, he says, I'm not going to preach to everybody else and I become a castaway. What I found even during this election season is that some people are, are Twitter thugs, Facebook thugs, internet thugs, keyboard thugs. But when you look at their life, their life reflects everything that they're cascading everybody about, which lets us know very clearly, don't be so quick to kill everybody else when their sin is similar to yours. It just hasn't been screenshotted. <laughs> so here we go. What, what we're saying is this is that God is clearly talking to his church to shore up their character as holy people to make sure and verify that their election is sure. So if you are in the social media world, you will find that there are people of influence that have to get their account verified. And the reason why they get their account verified is because there are a lot of people posing as them that are not them. And so the system gives you a blue check mark so that you can be aware of who is authentic and who is not. And what God says is be careful that you don't fall in love with your created version that you're no longer authentic to yourself. And this is why you and I need to daily make sure our elections are sure, our convictions are sure. And he says this, it is a famous uh, word that says caremdio, it's a Latin word, caremdio, which simply means that every day I live, I live in the eternal presence of God, under the authority of God, for the glory of God. So Coremdeo is just C-O-R-A-M-D-E-O, and it means this, every day you live, you live in the presence of God, under the authority of God, for the glory of God. So even when I'm working, I'm working for the glory of God, living underneath the presence of God, in the authority of God, to the glory of God. So I don't steal from my job because it's not the right thing to do alone. I don't steal from the job because I understand this. I live in the presence of God, I live in the presence of God. I live under the authority of God to the glory of God. If you got this in your mind, you're not so much consumed with what's happening each and every day because you know you are a part of the world, but you're not in, you are in the world, but you are a part of a different kingdom. And that's very important for you to know because if you don't, you'll be sitting there freaking out. What am I going to do with my job? How am I going to live? How am I going to eat? The same way you've been eating the last eight years. Same way you've been eating the last 12 years. So it is not to be ignorant and say, well, that doesn't matter because Jesus is king. We know he's king, but racism still exists, and we are the salt of the earth and need to do things about that, not just rely upon the easy excuse that Jesus is king. So here it is. Peter says very clearly, you and I need to make sure our election is sure. But then he gives seven things in verse number five, six, and seven, he gives seven things that will help you ensure that your election is sure. Number one, he says goodness. You need to have goodness. He says, if you have this as a part of your faith, goodness, you will see great growth. So he says this interesting word. He says, if your faith is going to grow, you got to supplement it. Okay, so how many of you have been taking like these 
pills to lose weight and all, all these different type of things, gain weight and all this type of stuff. And you're supplementing your, your, your meals and all that type of stuff. So sometimes, or multivitamins, when you don't get it, Naturally, you supplement it through multivitamins. You supplement what you're deficient in. And God is simply saying in this text through Peter is that, yeah, going to church is good, but you're going to also need to supplement your faith so that you can grow maximum. So number one, he says you need to have goodness. Goodness is moral, excellent virtue, which simply means that you just need to be good. You ever seen someone who wasn't good? Don't be that person. You know, it's funny when I said that, you had somebody in your mind and somebody probably has you in mind. Number two, knowledge. But this is an interesting word because it's not knowledge like you think. It doesn't mean go to Howard or go to Bethune or go to FAM or go to Rollins. It is not just that type of knowledge. It is knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit because knowledge is good but wisdom is greater when you spend time with the holy spirit he will teach you how to do your job more efficiently more effectively faster and better and they're like man how did you learn how to do that i i don't know how i learned but i spent time with god and said god teach me how to do this in a way that is more effective than the way i'm doing it it is drawn from the holy spirit Knowledge is important because it will teach you the right questions to ask in the boardroom. God don't need you in the boardroom talking about No, that's not what he needs you to do. But he can use you and have you ask the right questions that need to be asked so that his glory could be manifested. How did you know that? Were you in our meeting before? No, I, I, just, I just was thinking of these questions and I began to ask these questions because some of you want to create change and this is the greatest climate and culture for God to use your saltiness to create change. But God can't use you if you're too busy spending time on Instagram and not preparing yourself so that when he does call you, you don't sound like one of them crazy Christians. Pastor, what do you feel about crime? Like, okay, well, when you're done talking in tongues, can you talk in a language that we can understand? Give us perspective on how we can make adjustments because you can't make adjustments just by electing people alone. How do you stop crime? Well, we need a new person, we need this. That's great, but if you don't fix the family, you're not gonna fix crime. If mama's 35 and grandma's 42, <laughs> we, we gonna have some, we gonna have to, and there's no fathers because the father's in a pipeline to prison or he's got a record and can't work. And then he comes to the Christian and says, hey, I, I can't get a job. Can you help me? And all you say is, I'm going to pray for you. Y'all been praying for me all this time. I'm still unemployed. It would be nicer if the Christian had the knowledge to say, you know what? I'm not just going to pray for you. I'm going to connect you to another Christian that has a business that's going to let you work. And they're going to show you the glory of God by extending mercy to you through their business. Number three is self-control. Being able to regulate your passion. Self-control, being able to regulate your passion. Self-control, the ability to not respond to every comment that comes across your path. Some of you respond to everything and you ruin your whole day responding to people who don't have the intellectual quotient to hold an intelligible conversation. Self-control, not to respond to everything that displeases you, even with your spouse, even with children. Some things don't deserve a response. Number four, perseverance, which literally means to stay under. The ability to stay under God's care even when it seems like it'd be safer to leave. See, they were facing a lot of false doctrine. Back in the day, they didn't have YouTube, but they had scholars that thought they knew everything. And they were being tricked out of their faith. 
Well, God really loves you, then why would God allow this to happen to you? Well, God let it happen to his own son, so who am I to be exempt from it? So it's important that you understand your faith properly because if you don't understand your faith properly, you can't frame it properly. Perseverance is literally ability to stay under it. Next is godliness, which means piety, a man's reverence towards God. If you're more excited at seeing a rapper than you are seeing God, then you have a reverence problem. If Will Smith walked in the room and you fainted, but God walks in the room and you still keep sitting, you have a reverence problem. If Beyonce walks in a room and you throw all your golden pearls like the queen of heaven has arrived, you have a reverence problem. Idolatry is huge because man, if you're not careful, man is always looking for a savior. And Jesus is like, listen, I've already did that for you, so stop trying to get everybody to be my replacement. We look for our job to save us. We look for our boss to save us. And we put all of this confidence in flesh, and flesh will always fail you. You can't reverence your children. You can't reverence your spouse. You should not reverence your preacher. Hello, church. The only person that should be reverenced is God. Number six, brotherly kindness. Notice it's listed two times. Brotherly kindness is important because the first one is a, a fervent, it's, it's, a, it's called Philadelphia in which we get the city of Philadelphia. It's Philadelphia's name the city of brotherly love, but that's a biblical term. It's simply meaning a fervent, practical caring for others. Now, I'm, I'm going to step on some toes in a few seconds, and that's fine. Which simply means this, it's a fervent, practical caring for others. I don't have to believe like you to care for you. I don't have to like everything you like to care for you. That's what being a Christian is. No, I'm not, I'm not here to agree theologically with you. I'm here to care for you because that's what Christians do. If I see you hungry, I'm going to feed you. I'm not going to ask whether you're red or blue. I'm not going to ask what your lineage came from. Are you rich? No, I'm going to do what Christ asked me to do because that's what a Christian's supposed to do. Now, let's not get it twisted because a lot of you take the scriptures and you ruin it and you make all of us look crazy. Matthew chapter 5 says, when someone hits you, give them the other cheek. That's not what he's saying. He's not trying to be literal. If you want to be literal, then how about this? When your right eye offends you, pluck it out. You don't do that either. What it simply means is go as far as you can before you go and do something harmful to somebody. So I'm going to go the extra mile before I light you up. I'm going to let you go with some grace. Now that doesn't mean that you come to me and slap me. I'm going to tell you, here's the other cheek because that's what Jesus did. No, I'm going to try to avoid conflict with you at all costs. But if you bring it to my door, you will not like the results because that is not what Christ was saying. Because Ecclesiastes chapter number three, let me give you scripture. It says this, there's a time for peace and then there's a time for war. And what we got in Christianity is we got docile Christians that think everybody walks on them because I want to be like Jesus. And some Christians, y'all so quick to get angry and you can't fight. Like you think your Christianity absorbs you from getting hands put on you and you can say any type of thing you want because we are Christians. So fervent care number seven. Brotherly kindness, desiring the highest good of others. I want to see you win. No, let me tell you, 
When people say they want to see you win, they have a limit on how far they want to see you win. I want to see you successful, not too successful. I have a limit on what I want out of your life. No, we, we've got to take the limits off of people and say, like, however God blesses you, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. I'm riding with you because I want to see you win. If you get a new car, I ain't going to well, look, I bet you can't afford the payments. No, I, w I, wanna, I wanna see you genuinely win. And that that is a, a real challenge a lot of times because if you're honest, you live in your flesh. Now, I know you're gonna judge me. Some of you probably gonna go find another church, but most of them are closed, so you gotta stay here until we, another church opens. But listen, let me tell you this. So here's the reality. Um, have you ever been to a wedding? And then you see someone get married and you're like, how? You know how you do single people. You're like, praise God, you engaged, amen. When is it? I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with me because everybody else getting picked up but me. I don't know what, what is going on with me. I don't know if my tracks are showing. I don't know what it is. I, I don't, if my breath hot, maybe my mask ain't, my, oh my God, this breath, oh my heart. I don't know what it is, my foundation not laid right. I don't know what it, I don't know why it is because within us there is a slight shade when we see people doing the same thing we do but they're further than us. It comes from the womb. Jacob and Esau, when Jacob saw that Esau was ahead of him, he pulled him by the heel. Because I don't like to see you go too far ahead of me. Let us talk about us doing the same thing. Nate sells real estate. What's in there? Where is he? Is he hiding in the closet? Where is he? Oh, he's in the back. Okay, great. Don't, don't come out. Don't just, why, why are you behind the curtain? What is, what in the Jesus name is happening? I don't even know what, I didn't even know the curtains open up. But anyway, if we start talking about the same, come, come into the light. So if we start talking about the same thing, like I start telling Nate, I'm like, hey man, I, I sell real estate too. And they say, like, I sell real estate too. Well, then the conversation goes, well, who do you work for? I work for this company. How long you been working there? Oh, well, I work looking there for this line. Well, how many homes you sold? And based on his answer, if it's more than mine, then I start killing him. Because that's humanity. That's humanity. And a word of knowledge is this. Sometimes people are killing us because we tell them too much. Holy Spirit has to give you the wisdom to know where to, show, where to land and tell people your successes. Because if you tell a homeless person who's hungry how much food you have in his fridge, of course he's going to be mad. And we get mad at people, oh man, they don't have from I'm unemployed, and you call me to tell me about a job that promoted you. It's insensitive. It's not that you're hiding your blessing, it's just being wise to know they're not in a position to hear that. Thanksgiving is coming, y'all. Some people lost people they really love. So while you over here talking about, oh man, me and my whole family getting together, and you know they just lost somebody. That's what you call knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit. That I shouldn't say that even though it's not bad, but why am I gonna ruin their whole holiday to prove my own point. All right, I'm closing with this. Here's how to, here's how to wrap up election for you in a, in a simple way. And this is gonna bless all of you Apple users in a moment. Election is a term that I know gets lost because of uh, a theologian, John Calvin, has this thing called tulip, and everybody is like, made John Calvin an idol. By the way, John Calvin didn't even believe tulip when he died. Anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but here's a simple way to understand the doctrine of election. It's real simple. Have you ever been on a, on, um, as a kid growing up, you, you were, uh, you saw a bunch of people playing sports, maybe basketball. And back in my day, they would kind of do 
rock, paper, scissors? Or they'd be like, shoot for it. If you had a guy like me shooting, I would make it. If you had a guy like Robert Monroe shooting, he would miss it. So here's what would happen. I would typically make my shot, and then we would start picking. And we will go and be like, I don't want him. He look, he look like a football player, not a basketball player. But give me the tallest one. I get the tallest one. And then I get the other guy. And then Rob will pick his other guy. And then I pick my guy. And I pick my guy. Sometimes there's, this, there's three people and there's only two spots left. And then the guy that's the last three, one or two of them may dress like their basketball player, but you saw them do a layup and you're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, that ain't gonna work. So I might be like, all right, you know, I'm gonna pick him. And then I'm on the team because they picked me. Now I have a choice to say like, I don't wanna be on your team, Rob, because your team always loses. Like I could say that, which would be a true statement. I don't wanna be on your team because your team always loses. But I have the choice to say, I don't wanna be elected on your team. It's the same thing with Christianity. God calls us at certain stages in our faith. And you and I have to make the decision whether we want to be elected by him or not. And then God says like, but if I elect you, you need to make sure you do certain things to maintain you being on the team. You need to add these seven virtues into your life to supplement your walk with me so that you can continually grow as a believer. He says, because if you don't have these seven things, you're gonna be deficient. You'll be a Christian, but a deficient one. Now, here's how I wanna help you. When you're on a team, it helps you grow. It helps you serve on the team, it helps you add. Let me close with this in an apostolic way or an apple way. I have an iPad which has Face ID software. This iPad was created to know the face of the person that possesses it. This is very important because the only, my iPad possesses a lot of things on the inside of it, but the only way that it will unlock is if it recognizes my face. Okay, you missed it. It has a lot of capacity, a lot of things that will benefit me and help me, but the only way that it will unlock itself is if it recognizes my face. Okay, let me do it one more time. My iPad, I know it's hard for you Android people to understand what I'm talking about, but my iPad has face recognition technology, which means that it will recognize my face and allow me to access the things that it has that will help me be more efficient in my day-to-day -day life. God has some things reserved for you, but he can't let you access it because he doesn't recognize your face. Number two. So here it is. My iPad functions better and functions immediately when it sees my face. It is told to go to work when it sees my face. I want to ask you a question. Is God not working for you because he ain't seen your face in a while? Because as long as I leave it there, all of the power that's in it will never be accentualized because I'm not letting my face be in it. But here's the best part. You know, this morning at 4 a.m., I was going over my notes and just preparing for today. And in my balcony, it's completely dark. There's no light out there typically at 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. And I learned something very unique today. I sat out there with my iPad, and it was dark. And maybe many of you are in dark seasons. And maybe many of you are sitting there and saying, man, my life is so dark. Like, I don't, I don't even know how to get authenticated because my life is so dark. But God has a feature for that too. 
Do you know that even in pitch black, I touch my iPad, it said face ID. I put it to my face and it recognized me even in a dark place. I just want to let you know that even if you're sitting in a dark place and you feel like God can't see you, he recognizes you if you'll show him your face. That just because you don't feel good at this moment doesn't mean that God will not pick you. If God has already put his hand on your life, despite knowing all that he knows about you, despite knowing everything that he's heard, he's, <laughs> some people, listen, it has been said, some people don't like you because of a lie. God still likes us, even though it's the truth. This is why Paul, Peter says, don't forget, God elected you and you were in your dirt. That God still chose you and still allows you to lift your hands in his face, even though you ain't been in his face since two weeks ago. God still allows you to worship him, even though what has been on your internet log has not been pleasing to him. God allow, can I come down a little deeper? God allows you to worship him even though what you've been thinking about doesn't align up with his word. God allows you to worship him even though your actions have not been according to his word. And God says, listen, when you look at other people, remember yourself and make sure your own election is sure and make sure the grace of God is still on your life and know that even in the dark season, I can still see your face. As long as you'll bring your face to me, no matter how far you've been, no matter how dark, you could put on makeup and I still will recognize you. You could put a hat on, I still will recognize you. You could put on glasses, I still will recognize you. You could put a wig on, I still will recognize you. Because the beauty of the technology is it sees beyond what you put on and it knows exactly who you are. There's nowhere that you can, David says it best, I will make my bed in hell and you will be there with me. So today, if God picked you out of all the people in the world, if God would look over the corridors of heaven and the balcony of heaven and look down and say, I want him. But God, he can't shoot. I still want him. But he don't know how to make a lamp, but I still want him. She can't do this, but I still want them. If God would do that for you, that should be great pride that you and I take, knowing that I am his. And this election is sure that you who are in God's eternal hand can never be taken out of his hand. That if you're in the master's hand, he has you. He sees beyond what you see. He's okay with seeing you the way you are, but you gotta let him see your face. Don't let the mask stop you from masking your face before God. He's got to see your face. No matter how far away you feel from him, you've got to allow God to see your face. The greatest compliment that that text gave us was God choosing you shows you the value of who you are and your story. I know some of you, and I'm done, and I'm really, really done. I know some of you sitting here, oh, Pastor, you know, my story, my story is really bad. It's the worst story in the world. It's, it's horrible. It's been so bad. It's been this. And he still picked you. Look, I, 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 I done, God, I done, I done, God, I done did some stuff. I done murdered somebody, and I done, I done, and I'm not saying that's good. I, I done, I done, I done had this, and I'm not saying that's good. And I done, I done ran, I done did this, I done have crime, I got a record, I got all this, and God's like, I still picked you. You know what's crazy? 
Fonzo, let me borrow you real quick. Let me see. Let me borrow you real quick. Hey, it's good. Hey, it's good. All right. Uh, Sam, let me borrow you. All right. No shade. It's just an example. I got one pick to pr pick. I'm trying to win the team. I'm trying to win the game. And everybody would say, pick that guy. He's the biggest. No, pick him. He used to play for Lyman High School. Class of 2003. Center. Could have played college ball, all that. Pick him. No, 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 no. Come here, come here, Mike. Tell us. Come on. Then God, God says, no, no, no. I'm gonna bring someone else in the picture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring someone else. This is a, this is a Evans High School basketball player, star player. Back in 1999, he was doing his thing. Now you need to, if you want to win, if you want to win, you need to pick this guy. This guy looks like he can play basketball. Looks like and has the basketball ability. And God says, no, I don't want none. I want him. I want him. Now remember. You can't be judging anybody else when you're on the team because you remember what God picked you from. You really didn't deserve to be picked at all, but His grace and mercy picked you in spite of you, despite of you, and said, I still want to have you on my team. The beauty of it all is the winning team, everybody wins because they're on the team. Here, here, here it is. You on, the, you on the Lakers. You won a championship. And you over here talking about, man, I got low self-esteem because, you know, don't nobody know my name. But you're a champion. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if I'm good enough to do what God called me to do because I'm short. But you won a ring. Like, I don't, know, I don't know if God really wants to use me because look at all the other people that are so much better. And God's like, I picked you over them. So what convincing do you need? They're behind you for a reason. So if I was smart enough to pick you, I certainly am smart enough to know what I asked you to do, you can do. And sometimes, you, instead of you going to God with this face, you keep on bringing this face to God, and God's like, I don't know him. I can't help you, because that's not you. I can't do that, because that's not you. If you bring me your face, I will do for you what I have asked to be done for you. So, walk with confidence. Walk off that stage with confidence. Not like a rapper. Walk off the stage with confidence. 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 Thank y'all. Because you know that God picked you. It's not arrogance. It's humility because you know he could have picked somebody else. By your hands, let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you said and done. Perhaps there's someone in this sacred space that hasn't shown you their face because they're afraid, intimidated by their failures or who they are, what they've done. I pray even in this sacred moment that they would honor you with their life. Maybe it's their first time and they're, they just tuned in or watched a replay or someone sent it to them and they're like, man, I, I'm just trying to figure this Jesus thing out. And if God is calling you, how do you know he's calling? Man, I just feel like God is asking me to give him my heart. I don't know what it is. That's God electing and wooing you, as Scripture would say. Now, at this moment, you have the choice to receive him or reject him. And you may say, well, Pastor, I don't, I don't know how to receive him. It's very simple. It is acknowledging that you cannot do this on your own. You need to help 
and the person of the Holy Spirit. And you may say, well, I don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. That's fine. Thursday night at 7, go to Faith Talk. And Wednesday at 7, go to Faith Talk. Say, man, I just got saved. I got a few questions. And we'll help navigate you through that. But right now, whether you're watching online, if you want to give your heart to God, or if you're in the sanctuary, we want to connect with you. And all you got to do is text the word Jesus, yes, to 407-449-8884. Text that word Jesus, 407-449-8884. You may even be in the sanctuary. You may be like, man, I don't know what to do next. Text that word. Text the word Jesus to 407-449-8884. Text the word Jesus. 47449-8884. And we want to connect with you. But how do you get saved? How do you get saved? Well, first, God is drawing you to himself. That's nothing that you did by your own strength or your own merit, like I just showed you. He just picks whomsoever he wills. So at this moment, you have to acknowledge that you are a sinner. You can't do this on your own. If you could do this on your own, you wouldn't need him. He is the supplement that's going to help you live out the life of faith. So in this moment, you might be saying, well, what do I pray? What do I say? God, prayer is very vital. Prayer is not a formulation of great words. Prayer is a sincere conversation that you have with someone greater than yourself. And at this moment, all you got to say is you don't have to use all these great big words that they used to use. All you have to say is, God, I am a sinner, and I need that grace, that grace that will save me eternally. I believe you died on the third day and you resurrected. And even if I don't understand it, my faith will grow as I become a disciple. And remember this, if you're part of God's team, you can't do it alone. You need a church family. You need a body of believers that can surround you. You need to be discipled by somebody. You don't have to be discipled by a pastor. You just need someone who's a little bit further ahead of you in the faith to help you grow. Because we all help each other. We come to church to be equipped. Ephesians 4 says, the work of the pastor is to equip you for the working of the saints. We equip you to do the work. And in this moment, you are part of a family that may seem strange to you, but it's God's plan for you. Know that God picked you, not because of anything good that you've done, not because of anything good that you said, but because God is good. And he chooses whom he will for his purpose and for his glory. If you receive that, would you clap your hands? If you receive that.